this time. All right, everybody, you guys ready? Tip of the tongue, teeth yes, and lips. find your seats. Testing the mic. Welcome. There are open seats up here. I know, right in the front of the room. Um, okay, so we'll let everybody get settled. I'm Molly Sirota. This is Nick Livingston. Um, we're going to be talking today about how and why, as games user researchers, we should get involved with pre-production, which uh, I'm very grateful for Julian's talk, if he's still in here, because it's a nice, hopefully, this talk will be a nice lead into after his Set talk. us right up. Yes, thank you, Julian. We planned all of that. Um, okay, so just a little background about us before we dive in. I'm the lead researcher at the Sony San Diego studio, and the primary game that I support is MLB The Show. Yeah, and I'm the lead designer, and uh, I primarily work on MLB The Show as well, but I've had the honor of uh, advising on games from Naughty Dog, Santa Monica Studio, Japan Studio, the PlayStation Worldwide Studio. Before I get into why and how um, we as researchers can get involved with pre-production, let's first talk about what pre-production is. So pre-production is the beginning stage of the game development cycle. And the primary question that we're trying to ask during that time frame is what the heck are we going to focus on during this next development cycle? Um, to put that into more user research friendly terms, it's what user needs are we going to meet during this design cycle? And then the deliverable that comes out of pre-production is a high concept on how they're going to, on how the development team is going to address those needs. Yeah, from a design perspective, um, I'm now realizing that you guys already know that we might not be the most organized of uh, disciplines and a lot of creatives are, uh, can, can uh, get lost in pre-production. So I always contextualize pre-prod for my team is the minimum amount of work we need to do to identify what, who, and how we're gonna get something done so that we don't get lost in it. Perfect. So pre-production, uh, the way it works, at least for MLB The Show, is it happens one month after the game launches. Um, MLB The Show has launched um, yearly for over a decade now. So pre-production happens about one month after launch. And as far as the researchers' participation in it, we typically participate in the first two weeks of pre-production. But uh, I'm pretty sure it goes on a lot longer for the development team. Am for I us, correct? we're on a very short yearly recurring schedule so it's six to eight weeks um but that differs per team and per year depending on how ambitious we are sure um, so the first day of pre-production typically starts off with a post-mortem, and the user research team runs the post-mortem. A post-mortem is where the development team looks at what works and what didn't work during the previous um, development cycle. And then the research team, after the post-mortem, does a share-out on where the product landed now that it's been in the field for a month. And then all other days of pre-production that research is involved with follow a similar structure. Each day focuses on a different aspect of the game. So let's say one day will focus on customization. The development team then spends a few hours uh, messing around on the game on that particular area. Then they come to research. Research shares out any data they have on that particular area in the game. And then research runs brainstorming sessions on what need is going to be key to address on that section this coming development cycle, and then brainstorming sessions on uh, how exactly are we going to address that need. Okay, so why should games user researchers get involved with pre-production? Um, and it's probably going to sound obvious to the current audience, but um, it comes down to ROI, return on investment. The earlier we get data in the hands of our developers, the higher chance we have of those issues being addressed in the game. And the way, the type of data that you can hand off during pre-production is if you're working on a game that has already gone through at least one release cycle, then present data on any outstanding issues that the development team just wasn't able to address yet in the previous development cycle. 
If your game has not gone through at least one release cycle, you can do preliminary research or exploratory research on an area in the game that you know the development team wants to get involved with but hasn't explored yet. So to give you an example, let's say you're working on an open world game. Well, then do some preliminary research on open world games that take a similar approach that your development team's gonna be looking into. Find out what users like and don't like about that particular open world experience and then present that during pre-production. Let's say that um, you can't get into pre-production. Well, you can still send that data to the development team during the pre-production time and present it to them subject line in your email, pre-production tool, reference guide to look at of things to consider um, focusing on during this next development cycle. Okay, so how do you get involved with pre-production? This is not our gig, this is designer's gig. How do we get invited? For one, offer to facilitate in a way that says, hey, if research isn't invo involved right now, that means somebody on the development team is probably facilitating pre-production, which means they're not participating in pre-production. If you're offering to facilitate, that means that you're offering to allow their team to um, explore things together, participate together, and uh, they don't have to worry about running all of these different uh, brainstorming sessions or whatever the team is used to during pre-production. So offer to facilitate, offer to facilitate the post-mortem, offer to run brainstorming sessions, goal setting sessions, whatever it is that the team is open to or used to, um, offer to take that on yourself. Yeah, take, taking notes as well is a good thing, yeah. Offer to take notes during pre-production? Anything, anything that designers don't wanna do, which is most things, <laughs> Um, if you offer to do it, they're going to, you know, that's a good in. Perfect. <laughs> we'll talk more about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, another thing, another way that you can get into pre-production is offer up material that will encourage thought on what to focus on during the next development cycle. So like I was saying earlier, offer data on any outstanding issues from the previous development cycle that still need to be addressed in the game or offer preliminary research data on areas you know the team is interested in diving into. And again, if you're still not invited to pre-production, send it in an email. So at least you're, and label it pre-production material. Huh? That's pretty yes, good, right? Yes, in there, get yeah, it we, in there. We did that one time. Uh, Nick, how about you? Yeah, you got so any know thoughts? your stakeholders Super important. Um, I was the stakeholder in this case because I was uh, responsible for, for figuring out how to do pre-production, but there's other, there's other stakeholders in addition to me. I'm the lead designer, but then there's obviously the director, there's the producers. And I think it's really important that you get to know what who, you, who do you need to get the invite from is super important because you're, you're gonna approach a designer very differently than you approach, um, say, a, a director that's thinking about more business um, things and and then offer them the value that they're looking for right so for me I've already alluded to it a few times but like we're not the most organized and the and and the process is um, is evolving so the the most attractive thing to me in year one w was was that they were able to just offer help facilitating like Molly alluded to but um, identify who you're dealing with, what it is that they're looking for, and then just taper your, your pitch, sort of, so to speak, to that person. That's the most important thing. And then also, so pre be aware that pre-production is a very sacred thing, right, in the development. And, and already it's been talked about how uh, you guys are kind of coming in from the outside. Oftentimes the support group is thrown around a lot. And so it's important uh, to get in be just be cognizant of the fact that everybody is very they're, they they might be scared like what's the agenda you know what are they, what are they what and and it's a lot of people have talked about it already in their talks it's like we don't want to show we, we don't want to talk about things too early we get very uh squirrely about ideas and who's trying who's trying to push what but 
as long as you're you're coming with a helpful, supportive mentality, and you're wanting to offer to just think of yourself as an individual, I guess is one way to th- not as a discipline, and just what do you have to offer to the process and the people who are are trying to facilitate the process. Great. So that's all the ways that you can try and get yourself invited to pre-production. Um, now I'm going to talk about some of the ways to um, perhaps accidentally get yourself uninvited to pre-production, uh, which uh, did happen to me and the San Diego studio. Um, thank you very much, Nick. <laughs> okay. Uh, what not to violate when it comes to pre-production. For one, you're going to want to be aware of the physical environment that pre-production is held in. You want a room that encourages creative thought. And um, to simplify that, you just want a room big enough to hold everybody, uh, which uh, I did not do the very first year that we were invited to help with pre-production. Got hot. Yes. Uh, Sorry about that. So um, the first year that the research team ran pre-production, which was about three or four years ago, we held it in a room that um, didn't comfortably hold everybody that came to pre-production. And again, research is involved for two weeks straight, eight-hour days, brainstorming sessions um, with a bunch of people who are stuffed into this room. And we stole the tables from the break room. That's right. We also stole equipment to shove into the room, which didn't go over well with the rest of the studio. Some old wrenches. Yeah, that might have come back to haunt us as well. Um, So be aware of the physical environment that you're hosting it in. Also be aware of potential outcomes that might come out of the activities that you're going to be running. So during the post-mortem, again, post-mortem, you review what worked and what didn't work last year. And so I ran the post-mortem, and we first talked about um, what worked. And everybody had a say, post-it notes flying everywhere. People were talking about what worked, high-fiving, hugs. It was great. And then we talked about what didn't work, and um, that's when it went downhill. We had designers yelling at executive producers, a lot of finger pointing. Um, The tension was really heavy in this room that didn't fit everybody. Um, And we do it differently now. So we were eventually invited back. So now what we do is we kind of rotate back and forth. Give me an idea that worked well. Give me an idea that didn't work well. So that emotionally we're kind of even keeled in the room. That year we didn't, uh, so yeah, we're kicking off pre-prod not on the best foot. Um, also be aware of, a, of who you're inviting to participate in pre-production. I was very adamant with Nick and some of the other designers that we should get a lot of creative thought in the room. Let's invite people who aren't on MLB. Um, and then people who work in other areas of MLB but aren't really connected to the design system because they have a lot of creative thought, too. That was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> what the designers spent more time trying to explain what the heck is MLB to the people who don't work on MLB than they did uh, producing any material that was really made the time productive. Um, so be very aware of who you're inviting. Um, You also want to be aware and be um, honest with yourself and your team of what the opinions are of your research team at that time. So about three or four years ago, our research team was new at the San Diego studio. MLB had been releasing for almost a decade, yearly. They had not only never had an in-house UX research team, they had never done UX research, and they're very successful. And in walks us, and we're like, here are the issues on your game, and we can help you make it better. Uh, So (laughs) not everybody was open. It's actually two decades, but we we rebranded the studio and the game. There are people who have been working there, lots of them actually, since the 90s. And like, they come from that era for sure, right? And a lot of them are in senior management positions too, where they're like, this is all common sense. This is, you know, I hear the same things every time. And they also uh, think about marketing, more marketing-based research as well. When they think about research, they don't, they don't really differentiate. Differentiate the yeah. two. Yeah, so we were walking up. Nick was very open to research at the time, but we were still walking into a room of people that held a lot of that. Why are we inviting not only this team that we're not open to working on our game, but into this very sacred time in the game development cycle? Um, So I guess my biggest recommendation is don't violate these things. Um, 
but also uh, learn from every time you participate in any development cycle. Um, we've had to evolve our approach to pre-production every year. And that's not because just that the first year didn't work out so well, um, but even years that it did work, we have some of the same people coming back for pre-production the next year, so we have to keep it fresh. So let me talk you through how pre-production, our approach to pre-production has evolved over time. Um, so before MLB 17, again, about three or four years ago, research wasn't there, wasn't involved, and as far as I'm concerned, it was a very informal structure. Informal to say the least. I think, again, because it's the, the studio's been around for a while, they actually come from a place where they, you could find like pre-production Bibles back when they were trying to create whole super detailed specifications of exactly like how you're going to design the game, which then over time... Uh, we learned like is a complete waste of time because everything changes. Uh, so they threw the, the 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 that approach out. They didn't really replace it with anything. It was like the pro. We don't need process. We don't need planning. We just go. And so the prior to research's involvement, I came into the team and pre-production process was everybody put their ideas on a wiki page. And then someone who we haven't figured out who yet will prioritize that list by the end of pre-prod. And what it really turned into was every discipline jockeying for a, a, a list that gave them the excuse to say that their thing was a higher priority than the, this other than this other group's thing. And so we were we had a lot of improvement potential. Yes, in the process. there was a lot of potential. And, uh, and then we went to work trying to figure it out, and it took a little while. But. <laughs> okay, so the first year that research got involved with MLB, um, we hit some of the non-don't-violate-those -vi areas, but ultimately what research did to participate in pre-production, um, we like to call it the assistant years. Uh, we outlined the schedule for pre-production. We facilitated the post-mortem, ran brainstorming sessions, consolidated notes, took notes, ran stopwatches. We were an assistant that year. And then the following year was when we were told we were not invited back. Um, we had this big sit down, <laughs> myself and the research manager with all of these higher ups on MLB. Um, we had our notes out, we're like, okay, let's talk about pre-prod, what should we do this next year? And it ultimately came down to, no, we don't uh, need you guys. And I think it was more, <laughs> I don't want you guys. Uh, so we were a little thrown off by this, still wanted to be involved with pre-production. How the heck do you do that if you are uninvited to pre-production? <laughs> So we came up with what we call the packet. And the packet is this 40 to 50 page document that outlines all of the outstanding issues in the product, all of the areas in the game that should be considered or put on the table for focus for this upcoming development cycle. We emailed it out to the team about one week before pre-production. And as I said earlier, we labeled it as a pre-production tool or a reference guide to look at um, to get ideas on what to focus on during the cycle. And then four days before pre-production, Nip comes up and says, hey, uh, just kidding about being uninvited. Can you actually help um, throughout all of pre-production? <laughs> So again, we ended up facilitating postmortems, ran brainstorming sessions, consolidated notes, and I personally would love to say that it was all of the data that was in the packet, and that's why we got invited back. But I'm pretty. I sure haven't read it yet. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm just I think it was no. just the assistant. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I, the, the no, the packet is useful. I have actually I reference it a lot, and now they have it on a, a local drive. They have all they put all their stuff up there, and I didn't realize until we were pre preparing a little bit for this presentation. I, that Molly had no idea how often I think I look at it. To be honest, one of the things in our um, next slide was going to be that we were going to get rid of the packet this year. We're like, we don't need the packet anymore. We have no idea who reads it and who does read 40 to 50 yeah. pages. Yeah. The, mo the most important aspect of the packet for me is that you get to take the insights and I get to say, without having done any of the work, hey, go put all of these things on the backlog of things that we need to do this year for prioritization and just add it to the list. Um, 
and then pre-production obviously generates a bunch of other things that are thrown into prioritization, but it just becomes a blended in backlog list um, ready to be prioritized. And I think that makes a good point just in the sense that all of the things that we do as researchers, sometimes we're just not aware of the impact that the work we do offers. Um, one of the things that came up while Nick and I were setting up this talk is I, you know, I was talking about the assistant years, yeah. but this is one of the main reasons we're brought back to yeah. pre-production. It's not just that we're offering facilitation, but we're offering a way, and maybe you want to speak to yeah, this. Yeah, because it's, it's not just the grunt work and all, and all that. It's actually that um, user researchers are very good at like identifying and extracting insights from people with different perspectives. And so pre-prod pre is oftentimes in brainstorming and that kind of thing. It's a lot of different people in a room with different perspectives trying to find a collective vision. And user researchers can be very effective on just helping identify the through lines of conversations and like brainstorms and saying, okay, so the takeaways I feel like with the furious note taking and the post-it notes up on the wall and everything, extracting that down to some core takeaways and insights that came out of the brainstorm that everybody looks at and goes, yeah, that's, that's accurate, and that's what we all have kind of agreed on, right? Great. Okay, so then we move to pre-production for MLB 19, which is the current dev cycle that we're in. All which comes out next, a week from today, by the way. Which is also so why I'm here to pitch the fresh game. off a crunch <laughs> and just riding the wave, but... Check that out at your local retailer next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we get into MLB 19. At this point, we've decided we're not even going to ask if we're going to be invited because they're probably going to say no and then give us another four days notice, which FYI is not enough time to prepare two weeks worth of content. Um, you did great. Thank you. And thanks for the four days notice. No problem. Um, <laughs> okay, so what did we prepare for this dev cycle? We decided instead of just the packet, um, we're very aware that people don't read. People don't read in usability research. So we're not sure if anybody's reading this packet. We feel like in our studio, the, the way data is most consumed is when it's presented to the team. So we design presentations for every talk in talk in pre prod that or topic in pre prod that we think is going to come up for pre production and um, and so we have a presentation ready for at least 2 weeks worth of information or topics we also now are starting to get invited to other teams pre-production or post-mortem sessions um, so we're preparing for that as well at this point um, we, uh, Nick and I are now hashing out the schedule for pre-production together. He's say, saying how he wants it to run. I'm suggesting things that I would love research to do, and we kind of figure out a way to uh, meet somewhere in the middle. We're still offering up the packet this last year, facilitating post-mortems, brainstorming sessions, consolidating notes. Yeah, I found it really effective. Like Usually pre-prod starts um, with introspection, sort of, and like, if you're coming off of another project, particularly, it might be different if you're starting something new. We're always coming off of the last one, so that's what the postmortems in the process and and looking at that. When we shift our attention forward, I found it was really effective last year to actually embed in like workshop form uh, a research presentation. So like you, you you put it up there earlier, but play like have the designers play the game in the morning. We cater lunch, and then they come back. And then they're getting a presentation on all the insights. We've even had marketing come down. Um, we've had the PlayStation uh, guys come down. They, sh they have a lot of really great data, too, analytics and stuff. So then you've contextualized and you've set the table sort of for them to then go into a brainstorming session with a lot of information right there. Um, you bring up a good point that, um, and Nick knows this about me, food is very important. <laughs> For brainstorming, <laughs> <laughs> it is very no. important. I think yeah. the first year we had donuts. I think uh, sugar only lasts yeah. so long. So I'm uh, still learning how important nutrients are to the day to day, like yeah. just living life. Living, yeah. It's like it's super important, actually. I'm here to help facilitate this learning process. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this was our current development cycle, and just to kind of bring us back to my statement earlier on how research has a direct impact on ROI or return on investment. 
During this last pre-production period, data was presented to the development team on an important experience in our game that was missing from our game. And we then held brainstorming sessions on, to hash this out. How are we going to address this? And from what started out on Post-it notes are now our two leading modes in our next release title, March to October and Moments. And these are modes that are testing very successfully in all of the preliminary research we've mm -hmm. been doing. So research involvement in pre-production, the beginning stage of the development cycle, has a direct impact on the success of the released product. And just to kind of sum it up, um, pre-production sets the stage for the development cycle, and researchers' involvement can have a direct impact on that outcome, the final outcome of the product. But I think probably the most important topic for me to bring up that I haven't mentioned yet is that pre-production should be fun. It, if anything, we're working on games, so it should all be fun. Um, but pre-production right. is the one time in the cycle where the development team gets to think big, blue sky, any idea can be thrown on the table and they have room to think about it. It's the perfect time as a researcher to pre be presenting information to the development team because they're not up against crunch. They're not up against the release time. They have room to consider your thought. And it's not a reflection on their work, and so you don't have to deal with the potential spectrum of sensitivity that you're that you're dealing with, right? Because if you're not commenting on anything that they've made yet, they haven't made anything, so. Right, you're not hurting anybody. Plant seeds. Sensitivity, yeah, planting seeds. Um, yeah. So as games user researchers, um, it's our job to present data on our users' needs, on what they want and need from our video games, and what better time to do that than at the beginning of the development cycle before anything's been put in place. And that's about uh, it for us. Any questions? <laughs> Ask us questions. It's hot up I here. I dare you. <laughs> anything um great talk this was like directly analogous to my experience um with the top sports baseball team but don't worry i have hard data that i don't think we're um, <laughs> a, a competitor um <laughs> so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um any methodology you use to facilitate brainstorms like if you use some like generative design methodologies or anything like that to make the sessions as um uh, constructive as possible. Sure, I, I think, um, and we've kind of tweaked it each year, but uh, it it really is pretty standard brainstorming sessions. We have the team <laughs> go through posted exercises, five minutes, everybody on their own, hash out every th everything that should be addressed to this ne next coming cycle. Everybody puts it on uh, a post-it note for five minutes. And we have the team broken out into maybe four or five people per table. So we have about four or five tables. And then as a team, they hash out, okay, here they share out every post-it idea with each other. Then each individual table decides which one of these is probably the biggest issue or biggest area that we need to address. And then they share it out with the whole room. Then the team votes um, with different colored stickers. The voting process, I would say, is your guys' favorite the part. Fun. It's real fun. The what? The it's fun. It's the fun. Voting is yes, fun. Yeah, the voting stickers, is fun. You get stickers, you get to choose things. So the research team is writing up on a board what are the key issues that are coming out of each table. What is each table voted on amongst themselves, the key issues or areas that need to be addressed. And we're writing this out on a whiteboard or something. And then the design team comes up with a red and yellow and green sticker. Each one amounts to a different amount of voting. Like, this is your number one, this is your number two choice, this is your number three. And we do this all with the development team still there. And then we all hash out, even if there's a tie, oh, are these is this tie really is this really the same issue and it just merges into one or is one do we want as a team hash out which one is more important than the other and the team that's how the team decides what to focus on for that year 
We then go into a later um, brainstorming session where we take an area or two and, okay, here's an issue. How are we going to solve for it? And we run another five minutes um, individually on Post-it notes. They share amongst their teams. They vote as a team which um, idea do we want to flesh out a little bit more. We give them about 20 minutes to flesh it out, and that's what kicks off our entire design which cycle. It's on like a comics strip, basically, like, like six a storyboard comic strip where you literally with markers and talking, trying to just illustrate the uh, the idea. I think it's probably worth mentioning that the first year we did it, like we learned that a little bit of preparation in terms of the table topic it goes a long way like you leave it too open-ended you get a lot of really open-ended um, things but w especially when we put it in workshop form and you're coming directly off of say like a past product review or a uh, research that's either exp exploration based on other competitors um, or just aspects that we know exist in the game that we're trying to make you put those aspects you pull out an aspect of that and you put it at a table Right, so like the way we did it last year, and it was really successful. I thought was we kind of prepared a little bit, like what we thought those were, but then we also were open to flexibility based on the presentation and the reaction from the presentation. And sometimes we just write a new one and be like, "Oh, people are seem to be really vibing on this aspect of what we just presented." Put that at a table, and then everybody just stands up, and you just say, "Okay, go sit at a table." We announce the aspects on the tables, and people go sit at the table. And if one's really popular, then we just do it in round two. We keep the same one there and have different people do it, so that designers can focus on the area that's most interesting yeah. to them. Those two yeah. modes, though, it's really fun. I was just visualizing it when you were talking about it because they started as hilarious, like stick figure comics drips in pre-production you know of just aspects of the of the mode in its purest third grade form mm -hmm. and then it turned into a year later cool new things that are on the back of the box yes so from what i understand oh. hello thanks for sharing so from what i understand uh, you basically have a one-year cycle of developments uh, for one team can you speak to how you actually integrate and embed the user research part of your job into the design process? Because from my understanding, uh, you're very pressed for time. That's right. Uh, prioritization is uh, an issue probably, and you can't do everything. So That's can you right. speak a bit to that? Sure, yeah. Uh, Julian did a great job talking about <laughs> it actually right <laughs> before <laughs> us. Um, but go we're watch and, Julian's and we're, talk. Yeah, go just go <laughs> watch Julian's talk. Now, uh, we're, and we're still in the process of doing that, but the, where we've arrived now... Um, is I feel like our design team has learned the power of the paper prototype, that they don't have to have the finished product, that they can be testing things, and that they're, you know this group is not going to judge them, and that they're comfortable now. They've had that sort of phase over with now. So we've now, we do have, uh, I mean, I, I think we have, I hope we this year still have research tied to deliverables, on the on the schedule that's an easy one okay because the, the team expects to deliver things and then we research them but a lot of the the fun stuff is actually in the middle part where i mean it's pretty much all year long constantly. all year it's like yeah i mean i would say uh, the biggest thing for us is really nick um there are thank you nick um because he's he's the lead of the design team and so, and th there's, we change out designers. Um, every year the team is kind of fluctuating. People are going into different roles or new designers are coming in. So introducing that beginning stage, um, especially when uh, you're at a prototype stage right. and with a new designer, it's very hard to say like, now we're gonna go do research. And they're like, it's not done. So having somebody to back you up and encourage that process, even with somebody who is a little bit reluctant. But at this point, we're integrated at every stage. We're there at the prototype stage. I would say there's even more room to work on there. That's another I would discussion. Agree. Okay. Um, we're involved once code is behind it, and we're very involved um, right before release. We're play testing a lot. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, how are you going to make this happen? Because you don't have me. 
maybe. Uh, and I'm the biggest thing. I'm the biggest reason why. They, uh, <laughs> no, the, I think <laughs> I think you got to go and you got to talk. Find again, find the stakeholder, particularly in the design area. If you haven't already developed a relationship with them, begin to develop a relationship with them. And tell them, I guess, that a lead designer from PlayStation <laughs> talked about how helpful it is to just be able to say to like th the insights that come out of these groups. They come out in pretty like very deliverable ways, like, and they they rank the impact of them high, medium, low. And so it's such a head start for the for the backlog prioritization of a feature as well to just seed those into the backlog. Again, you don't have to prioritize them, but put them there for contention and prioritization. And I just go around and say, like, did we do all the things that the research people found? Because they're always right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And I would also say, I mean, even if the lead um, or whoever's, you're probably going to want to be looking for whoever's managing pre-production. That's who you need to get in with. Let's say they're not the biggest fans of research or uh, they're kind of here or there with it. Uh, they're guaranteed there is somebody on the development team who is on your side and see if there's a way to um, work that angle. And it's I shouldn't contagious. say it that way, but. No, but it's <laughs> contagious, like you said, because the people in the post-mortem that was facilitated um, last year all of a sudden you're getting requests to facilitate all the postmortems of other right. separate like modular groups in the studio and stuff and so then it just kind of takes hold and to be honest the reason we're now getting asked by other teams it really does come down to that original statement of hey you don't have to do anything i'll do it for you i'll plan it and facilitate and you can just sit there and participate if you want or just sit there and there will be food <laughs> and there will uh, be just food. eat the food yeah just come for the food uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's always a big thing. And I think that's why we've started to get involved with even more groups within the studio. I have a question. <laughs> nice. Oh, well, you have the mic. For you, yes. Molly. Um, you mentioned how um, during pre-production where it's still blue sky, it's a great opportunity to, to interject some data mm -hmm. into the discussion up front. And I'm just wondering if you could share some examples of the types of data that you share at that phase. Sure. Um, I'm going to have to talk a little bit high level. But... Um, but it's a bit what I was talking about earlier where um, there are some areas in the game, because this is a game that's already gone through a release cycle, there are some findings that we found during the previous release cycle that didn't make it into the game, uh, into the released game. We present that at pre-production. Um, this area in the game still has issues because we didn't have time to address it, which means it needs to be on the table for this year to address. Um, other times, what we are trying to play around with a bit more because it, it is hard in our field to constantly be the ones who are sharing out the issues in the game. Um, what's a, a bit more fun at times to share out is find out what areas in the game the designers are already mumbling about for next year. And they are mumbling. They don't <laughs> always want to talk about it too much, but... I'll find time to corner Nick and other designers and ask them, what are some of the key areas that you think we're going to tackle next year? And I, you, you have to do that a few months prior to pre-production because you need time to do research on that area. So um, now what we're starting to do is much more exploratory research on areas that we know are hot topics for the designers um, areas that we know they're interested in wanting to dive into during the next development cycle, um, and we'll do preliminary research on that. And typically that means we're researching other games that have this feature or take this type of approach, and we're finding out what aspects of that experience do users like and not like so that the designers now have a leg up on getting started. We probably have time for one or two more. Hi, uh, my name is Ahmed, uh, Ubisoft Toronto. Uh, question for you guys: um, How did you uh, put together? Like, was there ever, ever a scenario where user test feedback was different s from, say, what the hot topic was amongst designers? And how did you maybe convince them it, 
I don't know if it's a case where you had to convince them that this is something that's important or not, but just curious. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we fail at convincing, and then it comes up again during the next pre-production. Um, <laughs> and then sometimes it works. Um, we have a system that, depending on the, the research project, we have a system where sometimes we uh, give a ranking of this is a high priority area that should be addressed in the game. Th this is in our research reports. This is high priority, this is medium, this is low priority. And the way that priority is based is, let's say we're talking about a usability issue. If they can't get through the door and that door opens up to the whole game, then that's probably high priority. Um, medium is they struggle getting through the door, they eventually get through but there's a lot of struggle and then low is they don't come up on that door that often but it's a thing it is there and part of the experience um, so the the high priorities are having that prioritization system has been a way for us to emphasize uh, what areas are greatly impacting the game and should be considered uh, for this next development cycle yeah, I would say um, you can't all, you're not going to reach everybody all the time. Like, I have to talk a lot to the designers and about not being seduced by their vision of what, of what it, they had originally planned for. You know, that's a very seductive idea and people get attached to it. And so a lot of it is trying to like loosen that up and make sure that we're on a collective vision and that all these insights are coming from everywhere and you should be listening to them. But you're not going to get through to everybody. I mean, that's something that I think you just kind of have to accept it. Yeah, it comes with the territory. Right. And then sometimes you'll find out, like, three years later, you'll be looking at the game, and you're like, oh, my God, it made it in this yeah. year. And there was no discussion about it, yeah. and there was no presentation, because maybe you gave up. I don't know. but <laughs> Yeah. And there is, I mean, I can go sometimes and just go, did you check the box, you know, which is a powerful tool. I think like to, if you have that kind of, if you have somebody there that can just go cut, cut straight through it and say, did you do that? You know, yes, or, uh, yes or no. Um, but that's can be a painful process for somebody. I don't feel like we're ever working against the vision of any individual or anything. Yeah, I, don't I think know. most times it's just like small things, little course corrections is holding the vision, but just tweaking. The yeah. It's not like we're trying to completely shift the thing. If you're, if you're in that state, you probably got a lot bigger problems to be honest with you. Like you probably are dealing with design, a design team. That's just, I don't know. Not, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Enough said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you mentioned exploratory research earlier, and um, I've been working at banks, and we probably have a very different design process. So usually when I think of exploratory research, I think of money mind maps with talking to participants in early stages. Do you have any exploratory research with players where you're like, what are your feelings about open world RPGs or something like that where, it's, where, where you don't have a prototype, you have nothing yet. You just kind of want to get opinions from players about what they like about games and what, how they think and how they feel. Absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes it's, um, uh, sometimes it's just a description that people are going off of, a high-level description of like, what if you have this experience in a game? Or sometimes it's images that we literally Google images yeah. of a open world <laughs> concept. Um, and that's what we're showing to people. Like, what does this make you feel? <laughs> um, what does this image, what's going on in this image? So that we can start getting a taste of, hey, if we use this type of color, um, it implies this type of experience. If we use this type of um, body armor, it implies this type of experience where we're not even pulling from, we have no concepts to go yeah. off of. We're just pulling from uh, other <laughs> things that we yeah. find in the environment. And there have been times where the research team puts together the prototypes. Uh, it's copy and paste art projects where we're like, and we create a board game out yeah. of a uh, I see Carly like smiling. Yeah, I know. I remember, They're so like, fun. I remember a specific 
Like there's a, I hear things like this because a lot of times the first research session, I've, I'll hear things like you'll you or the, the other researchers will just be saying to designers, "Okay, could you just get me like a description?" You know, like, uh, and they'll start with like literally just a feature description, and it's on a piece of paper, and it's like, read that description and tell me what you think, and then they start pulling words out of it, you know, that like really are resonating, and then, but then from there, ideally, you also maybe have a paper prototype, and there was one super convoluted one where Carly had like, yeah, was it a card game? Was it the card? You, there was like branching pieces of paper based on like if they were gonna make certain choices. And so it was like, okay, which one do you choose? That one, okay, let me get the piece of paper. And then that one, yeah, how about this? What is this? And then look at that, and talk to me about that. And then, you know, it, it but it, it comes out, you get, you get a lot of good insights from that. Cause you at least learn, okay, what are they, th what, how is the concept resonating mm -hmm. and how are, uh, that's the core of the experience. How are they feeling about it and what is it? Yeah, yeah. and you can test Powerful. the flow of the game idea just yeah. by building a makeshift board version And we of haven't done any concept. work to put it in. Talk about, you know, ROI, which is a little bit of a trigger word for me as a designer. I but, know, sorry, there's but money involved. talk about ROI, you now, we haven't even put anything in the game yet, we, so so now we have the, the flexibility to, to adapt based on, oh, that, yeah, no, that screen design is way too complicated, which is usually the case in the first design. It's always too much or something, and then, and then you refine it and you, you get it down before you even put it in the game. All right. Thank you, guys.